Yeah, you can go ahead and go to it. Well, I guess we'll get started. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Weatherby, uh, also known as the Humble Bard. I uh, want to thank everybody for, for uh, tuning in tonight, and I uh, uh, hope we have a, have a good, good presentation for you. Uh, cameraman tonight is uh, Mike Magnuson from the uh, Hawaii Library, and uh, they do a great job here, and they've always been very supportive of all our programs, so we're, we're, we're glad to be here. Um, just uh, by way of introduction a little bit, the uh, reason I call myself the Humble Bard is that uh, my wife Betty, my daughter Megan, and I, we, we put out a, a monthly magazine called the Humble Bard Magazine. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. These are all short stories and poems, uh, cover a variety of different topics that, uh, uh, that I write, and uh, I simply write the stories. My wife Betty, my daughter Megan, they do all the, all the bulwark. They do all the typing, all the formatting, uh, all the... Uh, photographic work. Uh, I just write stories. So I couldn't do it without them. So I just want to take an opportunity to tell them how much I love them and how much I appreciate them uh, helping me out with my hobby here, <laughs> which has gotten me much more than a hobby. <laughs> but uh, uh, tonight, uh, uh, of course, next week, yeah, next week is Halloween. So uh, we decided we do a, uh, a thriller that I wrote a while back called Whisper Valley. But before we actually get started in that, I, I had a couple other things I wanted to mention. Uh, about a couple of short uh, articles that I wrote uh, in the last couple of magazines. Uh, in the October issue, um, I wrote an, an author's note in the back of the magazine concerning a, a pet cow of ours named Amelia. <laughs> uh, Amelia passed away on September 19th, and it was a, a very sad day for our family. Uh, all of our animals mean a tremendous amount to us, and uh, so I wrote this article in the back just to kind of, I don't know, it's just my way of grieving and kind of letting people know, how, you know what we feel about our animals. And since that, uh, that issue has gone out, uh, we've gotten a, a number of uh, uh, condolences and sympathy cards and, and very kind thoughts. And we want to say thank you to everybody uh, uh, for their kind thoughts and sympathies. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Also, uh, another thing that's come to mind uh, uh, back in August of this year, uh, I wrote the second half to a story called uh, The Cow That Jumped Over the Moon. And in that, uh, in that particular issue, uh, I wrote a foreword called uh, Our Secret Lives. And we continue to get uh, uh, a lot of response about that and comments and stuff. Uh, people seem to truly enjoy that. Get my glasses. So I thought I'd read that again because uh, it, it's about something that's become very important to me over the last couple of years. And, uh, I think it's kind of important to everyone. So uh, real quickly, I'd like to read this to you, to this, for, this forward to you called Our Secret Lives. And I'm gonna read this to you just as it was printed in, in the magazine that night. Dear readers, over the past several years, I've begun to ask the questions, why are we here on this earth? What is the true purpose of our existence? To be honest, I have not discovered any earth shattering or cosmically influenced revelations, but I have developed a few theories of my own. Please bear in mind these theories are simply my own thoughts and opinions. They are in no way intended to influence or persuade anyone in any way. One of the theories I have developed is what I call our secret lives and it goes like this. I believe the true purpose of our lives is, is to enjoy life itself. It seems we are all, are all so busy rushing around, running to and fro, trying to accomplish so much in a day's time that we neglect to appreciate the day itself. What if this day became our last day on earth? Could you or I honestly say that we enjoyed this day? Could we say we helped someone or provided comfort to someone in need? Could we truthfully say we had no regrets for anything we did on this day? In the course of a day, most of us interact with dozens of people and or animals, if only for a few fleeting moments. We encounter someone and say, hello, how are you doing today? And perhaps a 30 second conversation ensues and then we hurry on our way to accomplish the task at hand. Perhaps we stop for just an instant to pat our dog on the head as we leave for work or give our spouse a quick peck on the cheek as we rush away to generate an income. These fleeting moments, these hurried encounters are what I call our secret lives. To me, these are the most precious moments of any given day, and yet at the end of the day, they rarely register in our memory. Please do not be misled. I am as guilty of this negligence as anyone but I have begun to recognize these snippets of time for what they really are, the moments of our lives. They are the things I wish I had done if today became my last day on earth. 
I call these minuscule moments our secret lives because they are so fleeting, they are, they are secret even from ourselves. So I say, why not be more conscious, conscious of these encounters? Why not extend that 30 second conversation to 45? Why not kneel down and hug your dog or other pets and tell them how much they mean to you before you go to work? Why not embrace your spouse and kiss them as passionately as the first time you made love? How much time would it really take to more fully indulge in these secret lives of ours? What would it be worth if today became our last day on earth and we could honestly say, I live this day to the best of my ability. I can leave this earth content with no regrets. Throughout the cow that jumped over the moon, I have attempted to expose these secret lives of ours. All the interactions between characters, both human and animal in this story are based on observations I have made over the past few years. In this story, I have attempted to bring the secret lives of these characters to the forefront. It is my hope that in these hectic troubled times, you may discover your own secret life and embrace it. I think uh, as time goes on, it becomes more and more important that uh, we recognize these things for what they are. And, uh, and one reason I'm bringing this tonight is a lot of people have asked us um, how we fund this, how we, how we uh, afford to do all of this with a magazine. Uh, we currently have about 600 monthly readers and we're printing about 30,000 pages a month. And to be honest with you, I really don't know. <laughs> I mean, it comes out of our pocket. Uh, we we get, gotten several donations. We, we did receive a grant from the Go Art Society this past spring, which helped tremendously. Um, and about the time I start scratching my head, I think, man, how am I gonna do this for another week? something shows up, a contribution from out of the blue. Uh, it's kind of a, it's a very strange thing, but we're very appreciative for all of those things and for whatever source it is that, that brings them to us. So that's one reason I wanted to mention this and thank everybody for all their contributions and comments that uh, help us along the way. And one of the biggest things that help us along the way is uh, to keep going is feedback. We thrive on response from our readers. Um, my wife, Betty, my daughter, Megan, and myself, uh, we farm. Uh, we both work full, we all work full-time jobs. And collectively, we spend about 40 hours a week putting the, putting the magazine together, uh, not to mention the books and other things. So the more feedback we get from my readers, the more, uh, uh, it's, that's our reward, basically. And it's, it's great to hear from everybody. Plus, it gives us an idea of what people like. So, so it, uh, we really appreciate those comments. So to start out uh, tonight, uh, uh, we're a week before Halloween, so I got a couple very short poems before we get to the main story. And uh, Halloween's always been one of my favorite holidays, probably the favorite holiday. Uh, we do all kinds of things around our house and that, trying to scare my daughter, whatever. We, we plant, uh, we put skeletons in her bed and live, not live spiders, big, big hairy fake spiders, all kinds of places that we shouldn't. <laughs> and then she retaliates by putting stuff uh, in our bed or in the car or in the barn. Uh, so it's been a fun time and it's always been kind of a fun holiday for me. So uh, looking back over the years, uh, I got thinking about all the things we used to do as kids. And uh, so I wrote this short poem called Halloween Past. I remember growing up on the family farm so many years ago. Where pray tell of all the years gone? The answer to that question, I guess I'll never know. We had lots of chores to do long before morning light. And so within those pre-dawn hours, our imaginations soon took flight. I would think of all the things that might exist beyond our flashlight beams. And they became the stuff of legends of those long past Halloweens. Halloween was our favorite holiday. It ranked right up there with Christmas and all the rest. In the evenings, my sisters and I would tell each other scary stories. It was a competition to see who could tell the best. Well, lo and behold, we scared ourselves silly, trying our best to terrify each other. But no one tells a hair-raising tale better than our own dear sweet mother. Mom would read us spooky, spooky stories, and what a blast that was. But while doing those early morning chores, it's amazing what your imagination does. Mom once read a book by Stephen King entitled Salem's Lot. My sisters and I were much older then, so we begged her to let us read it, and she agreed, but alas, braver we were not. Each night for three nights straight, we read that book before we went to bed, and then as we performed our pre-dawn chores, we were constantly on the lookout for vampires and the undead. I mean, it was tough enough milking cows and feeding calves and trying to get ready for school on time let alone pitching hay and bedding stalls while, while carrying silver crucifixes and wooden stakes carved out of pine. Well, it's been, been many years now since those childhood days when we entertained ourselves with scary tales that gave us thrills and chills. 
And now we have families of our own and get scared to death just trying to pay the bills. So each year when Halloween rolls around, I'm grateful for those Halloweens of the past. They were so much fun when we were young and made those memories that will last. There's all kinds of uh, Halloween characters out there, werewolves, uh, witches, warlocks, uh, vampires, zombies. Uh, but the one that impresses me, maybe one of the most anyways, are our imaginary friends. Now my wife says I get confused when I read this uh, because she says I just imagine that I have friends. But, <laughs> but I'd like to read you a short, uh, short poem about uh, uh, an imaginary friend that, uh, uh, well, wasn't just mine, but somebody developed. This is called My Monster Fred. While I was growing up, our family often moved from place to place. My father was a rising star within a company for which he worked, and so we had to relocate in order to keep pace. Being an only child, my friends were often imaginary ones conjured up within my head. They were always there when I needed them, and my best friend of all time was my monster Fred. Fred was big and hairy, but he had a heart of gold. He was my constant companion from about the time I was 10 years old. I kept Fred a secret from my parents, for I was afraid they would not understand. I did not wish, wish to worry them needlessly or cause any interruptions to the fun things Fred and I had planned. I did not believe society would accept Fred for the gentle beast he was, and so he became my best kept secret while I was growing up. We launched rockets in our backyard and discovered buried treasure beneath the earth. We played a million childhood games together, and I could not begin to place a value on what his friendship was worth. Fred was always patient and understanding, for him a cross word was never said. And on dark days, he chased my blues away. That's my monster, Fred. Usually Fred slept in my closet, for he's much too large to sleep beneath my bed. He only had one eye, but what a swell guy. That's my monster, Fred. Fred had a voracious appetite, and it was quite a job just to keep him fed. I would smuggle, smuggle his food from the kitchen to my room and then hide the dishes beneath my bed. Fred had an incurable sweet tooth, and so on nights when mom made her famous chocolate mousse, I would sneak extra portions for Fred to my room where we would enjoy them while reading Dr. Seuss. As I grew up, Fred did also, and together we both matured. But through it all, we had a ball and our friendship has endured. And now I have a family of my own, a wife, two children, and a dog named Ray. But Fred is still my best kept secret and remains so to this day. I have become quite successful. And now I own my own company. I have a silent partner, partner who has never been seen. He is brilliant and mysterious and he is always on the go. He's a member of my board of directors. In fact, he's my company's CEO. And now Fred and I dress distinguishedly. We wear Armani suits and ties. We dress for success, and Fred's red Zanetti loafers match the color of his single eye. We publish books from around the world, texts full of fact and fantasy. We translate and decipher and then distribute for all the world to see. It is a complicated business, full of boilerplate and legal liabilities, but my partner and CEO handles all of them with ease. He is well-versed and educated. His accomplishment adorn our office walls. And though he is never there, he has an office just down the hall. I confer with him several times each day to clear the cobwebs within my head. He is always there to clear the air. That's my monster, Fred. And although he is a mystery to my clients, staff, and family, they recognize his accomplishments and his value and treat him with respect and dignity. Now, one might think I should seek professional help. In fact, more than once I've heard it said, but I am content and have no fears to vent as long as I have the love of my family and friends and my monster Fred. <laughs> so I hope you all have a nice imaginary friend. Gotta have somebody to talk to. I talk to myself all the time and uh, with 23 distinct personalities, I never get lonely. So now that brings us uh, uh, actually to the, the main story tonight. Uh, uh, I wrote this, I think about two years ago. Uh, I'm not really sure where the idea came from. Uh, just one of those, something somebody said, or I color I saw or uh, something, but uh, uh, the name of this story is uh, Whisper Valley. Now I, I call this a thriller. Uh, I don't do blood and guts, that's not my style. Um, I just like to keep things uh, eh, a little bit scary once in a while. 
So uh, this is Whisper Valley. Of strange and eerie places, I have held a lifelong interest. There's sheer numbers my mind cannot begin to tally. But the strangest place I've ever known lies just a few miles from my home and is known to all as Whisper Valley. As a preacher's son, I heard my father attempt to explain away all sorts of mysteries, using divine providence as a way of saving faith. He'd say, God works in mysterious ways. We should be content to accept the things we do not understand and live humbly within his holy grace. I love my father dearly, and I never questioned his resolve to serve God and his congregation, although I thought his ways were somewhat strict or maybe simply formal. But in my mind, the back roads and the alleys of places like Whisper Valley begged me to become an investigator of the paranormal. Over the past 20 years, I've visited countless strange and mystic places and have attempted to resolve their mysteries by all types of sound and scientific means. In most cases, the mysteries have been resolved and the local fears and myths dissolved, but the veil of mystery around Whisper Valley is, in, is impenetrable, or so it seems. As a child growing up just outside of Elmwood, a small town three miles from Whisper Valley, I heard all the legends surrounding this mystic place. My parents and grandparents told me never to go there, and I could see the concern and fear in each one's face. On Sundays, just after church, I would drift among my father's congregation, and stories of Whisper Valley would be told. Some said it was haunted, others claimed it to be, to be evil, but most agreed it was a residence of lost and wandering souls. The legend claimed that if you went there alone and stood on Hemlock Ridge that formed the east wall of the valley, you would hear your own name whispered on the wind. And if you stayed too long, the wind would call you like the siren song and you would enter never to be seen again. So of course, when our families were unaware, my friends and I would ride our bikes up Furlong Road and sit atop Hemlock Ridge. There we would regale each other with stories designed to raise your hair. But soon the wind would begin to blow and we would all agree it was time to go. Some unseen presence could be felt within the air. Hemlock Ridge was a vast sloping plain of small stones and sparse vegetation that remained the same throughout all time. At the bottom of the valley ran an abandoned railroad track. The west wall of the valley was steep and covered in a dense forest of pine. One day when I was 12, I decided to go up on Hemlock Ridge, determined to conquer all my fears. What happened there that day has kept me far away for almost 20 years. I pedaled my bike up Furlong Road. The day grew warmer as I climbed that lengthy hill. When I reached the top of Hemlock Ridge, I sat atop a large limestone rock. The sun was hot and the air was deathly still. I stared out over the expanse of that mystic valley, past the abandoned rails of the Elmwood Rockland lines. And although there was not a breath of air, I watched in awe of those swaying pines. They seemed to be waving to me, not unlike a long lost friend. And when I tried to look away, I found I could not. Somehow, some way, I was hypnotized by them. And then I felt the wind begin to rise way up there upon, upon that lonesome hill. And though the sun baked the tarmac of Furlong Road, I felt a cold and eerie chill. I was mesmerized by those distant pines out past the railroad tracks that held no historic claim. I found myself walking towards them, and upon the winds, I heard my name. Joshua, Joshua, the voice called to me just like a lullaby. And as I moved slowly toward that sound, a large shadow appeared upon the ground and I detected movement in the corner of my eye. And then suddenly something large swept me off my feet and I cried out in ragged fear. And as it pulled me back toward Furlong Road, I recognized him as he strode for it was none other than my grandfather dear. He put me in the cab of his old pickup truck and set my bike down in the pickup bed. And as we pulled away, I thanked God Granddad had come that way, and Granddad simply sighed and shook his head. Further down the road, Granddad, Granddad said, I knew you would come here alone someday, just to see if the tall tales you've heard were true. You have an inquisitive mind, but today it almost got the best of you. He said, I'm not angry with you, for I, in my, I see myself in you. I know the legend has grown by leaps and bounds, but I tell you, there is evil within those grounds. I said to him, Granddad, I'm sorry I disobeyed, but I just had to know if the tales were true. 
That pine forest called out to me, and I would have gone if it were not for you. With that, Granddad pulled over to the side of the road, shut off the truck, and looked me in the eye. He said, the story I'm about to tell is a true tale straight from hell, and I'll not forget it till the day I die. Granddad said, the Elmwood Rockland lines ran several short railroads into small towns throughout these eastern Kentucky hills. These trains carried lumber, coal, and grain, the raw materials needed for those mountain mills. He continued, in 1889, the company decided to run a track straight through Whisper Valley in order to cut off several miles of extra lines. There was lots of opposition to this idea, for the legend of Whisper Valley was well established. No one wanted to work near those mysterious pines. The company offered to pay double the going rate to any man willing to work part as part of a 20-man team. It took a while, but finally enough men were hired. You must understand, money was very tight back then. Times were hard and lean. I watched Granddad as his, as his story unfolded. His eyes seemed to drift back to that time and place. I could sense the powerful emotions swelling within him. I could see the pain etched upon his face. Granddad said, construction began on that stretch of track in April 1889. It was estimated to take six months to build if all went well. Construction should be complete by October of that same year, but that stretch of track soon became known as the railroad to hell. He continued, the work gang was led by a good man. He was well-liked and respected by all he knew. He was intelligent and resourceful and worked as hard as any man in that valley. And truth be told, I can see his resemblance in you. I was shocked by grandfather's words. I stammered, you mean he was? Granddad interrupted, yes, Joshua. <clears throat> yes, Joshua, he was your great grandfather, my father, and a better man never set foot upon this land. But this valley, this evil valley, took him away from me and the rest of my family, just swept away by Satan's hand. The tears streamed down Granddad's face. I was so shocked, for I'd never seen him shed a tear. But I felt these tears were not simply tears of sorrow, but rather they were a mixture of pain and rage, fueled by the relentless march of years. Granddad continued, construction of the, of the track began right on schedule, April 1st of 1889. But problems arose right away, and the workers blamed whatever forces lurked behind those swaying pines. My father would come home each night and tell of whatever pitfalls befell them on that day. He said the air was still and hot as they worked. It made no sense because those pines would continually bend and sway. One day as the crew arrived to start work, they found all the timbers splintered and broken. My father managed to get new timbers brought in. The fear each man felt, felt lingered in their minds, but was never spoken. Grandfather said, a few days later, as the crew arrived in the morning, they found several of the new rails bent and twisted beyond repair. Then the workers voiced their fears, what powerful forces had been there. It took all the resources my father had to keep the crew together. And then the project stalled for one whole week due to a nasty stretch of weather. The first day the men returned to work, one of the railroad owners came by to speak to the men. He said the crew would have to work around the clock in shift. In shifts, the project was more than a month behind by then. When father came home at night and told my mother and us kids, my mother begged him to resign. He hugged us all and told us not to worry. They would finish the job early and everything would be fine. For the first few weeks, things seemed to go more smoothly. The men worked in shifts all through the night. The families of the crew members would bring them meals and visit for a while. It seemed that things would be all right. But then the accident started to occur. One man fell and broke his leg. Another was bitten by a rattlesnake. Still another lost a hand in a buzzsaw mishap while cutting timbers. The human cost of this project was becoming much more than the crew could take. I sat paralyzed in grandfather's pickup. My eyes were glued upon his face. As he continued to, st to tell his story, I wondered what kind of primeval forces dwelled within this ghastly place. Grandfather continued his story. One by, one by one, men began to resign amidst more accidents and mishaps. The emotional strain on the crew was intense. Nothing my father would do could make the men rally. Replacements could not be hired. No one wanted to work in Whisper Valley. The men reported hearing strange sounds from within that forest of pine. At night, shapeless shadows appeared flitting amongst the trees. 
Historia played havoc within the minds of the crew, and nothing my father did would put the men's minds at ease. By September 1st, the project was little more than half complete. The crew was down to just seven men. It appeared that against the forces that dwelled within Whisper Valley, the railroad simply could not compete. On the morning of September 2nd, two more men resigned. My father paid them their time and wished them well. I left only five men to work both day and night on this project bound for hell. At supper time, mother and I brought father his evening meal. Other families brought meals to their menfolk too. Father said they would all be home by 9 a.m. Sunday morning for church. After services, they would discuss what they should do. Sunday dawned a gray and misty morn, a sure sign that autumn was on its way. 9 a.m. came and went, and father had not appeared, so we went to find out what had caused his delay. The families of the other men joined us, as their menfolk also had not returned. And so we all headed toward Whisper Valley to see what we could learn. The families parked their buckboards on Hemlock Ridge, just off of Furlong Road. And together we started down that rugged hill on foot. A cool fog and mist surrounded us as we strode. I was the first one to reach the workers' camp. Not a soul was within my sight. Together we searched the entire camp, but we found no one, yet the campfires were still burning bright. It was as if they had all took flight just minutes before we had arrived. Awful thoughts plagued our hearts and minds. Something evil had happened here. Had any one of them survived? We continued to search the immediate area around the camp in the hope of finding some clue that would be redeeming. When we looked more closely around the campfires, we discovered the coffee in the workers' mugs was still warm and steaming. As a group, we decided to return to town and get more help, and so determined we trudged up that treacherous hill. About halfway up, I stopped and looked back, and those ever swaying pines stood tall and perfectly still. My eyes never left grandfather's face as he continued to tell this harrowing tale. Occasionally, he would look out his window toward those swaying pines, and his suntanned face appeared to pale. Grandfather continued, we went straight to the sheriff's office. Bill Payne, my father's friend, held that office back then. Within an hour, he had assembled a search party of 30 hard and seasoned local men. All of them were apprehensive. They were all too familiar with the tales about that awful place. I was proud of every man jack one of them, for those scared they sent out with determination on their face. As the search party headed towards Whisper Valley, Mother Nature turned a cold eye upon the crew. The fog and mist became thick and cold. Rain and sleet pelted them as the wind blew. There were three buckboard wagons filled with men, and several others rolled their mount own mounts, as did Sheriff Payne. And as he neared the top of Hemlock Ridge, it appeared their search may be in vain. At the top of Hemlock Ridge, just a few yards off the Furlong, Furlong Road, Sheriff Payne brought the search party to a halt, and from the buckboards, men started to unload. Sheriff Payne ordered three men to remain with the horses to try and keep them calm and still. The rest of the men battled a cold and relentless downpour as they started down that windswept hill. When the search party reached the workers' camp, Sheriff Payne ordered the men into a skirmish line. And there, ravished by wind and rain, those brave men started toward those swaying pines. The line moved slowly forward. The wind, a constant howl, echoed within their ears. And though battered with hailstones the size of dimes, the men advanced despite their growing fears. When they were but 10 yards from entering that dark and dense forest of tall and menacing swaying pines, the wind released, up, released all its pent up fury and played havoc with that skirmish line. Men cartwheeled backwards like so many tumbleweeds. Rain and hail lashed their hands and faces until they bled. Sheriff Payne ordered them back up Hemlock Ridge and thus from Whisper Valley, the searchers fled. The men gathered briefly at the abandoned camp near the unfinished track. Sheriff Payne yelled above the screaming wind and said, we will try again after the storm. For now, we will be lucky to get back. And so together the party climbed up that treacherous valley wall, nature punishing them at every step. And as they neared the top, they could hear the terrified screams of the horses shying away and prancing where they had been kept. The men handling the horses had their hands full, trying to keep the terrified animals at bay. At one point, when the wind gusts knocked them down, two of the mounts managed to run away. Somehow the searchers managed to get into the buckboards and upon the remaining mounts and then headed quickly back towards town. They were drenched and shivering, exhausted and bleeding, and they prayed for deliverance with heads bowed down. 
Miraculously, the search party made it, made it to the livery stable and took shelter with the horses within its sturdy walls. And as the horses were tended to, Sheriff Payne thanked them all. The sheriff said he would notify the families of their failed attempt. They would try again as soon as the storm had passed. Every man volunteered to search again as they headed toward their homes at last. The storm raged on for three more days. Wind and rain, sleet and ice pelted the area around Elmwood. The weather was not fit for man nor beast and the prospect for survival of the miss missing men certainly was not good. When the storm finally subsided, further searching was not possible for days due to flash flooding in the valley. But when Sheriff Payne made the call for volunteers, again, 30 men made the tally. One week after the storm had ended the search party, one week after the storm had ended, the search party set out once again, led by Sheriff Payne. Every man appeared ready and determined, but secretly in their minds, they thought their actions were in vain. I studied grandfather's face as he continued to tell me of these events that occurred so many years before. It, and it seemed as if his face was cast in stone, while his mind's eye recalled these events as if they had happened just the day before. Grandfather continued, once again, the searchers reached the top of Hemlock Ridge and began their descent down that treacherous hill. And as they slid and fell in the mud of that slope, the wind whipped up a devastating chill. By the time they reached the abandoned tracks, they were all wet and cold and bleeding. There was nothing left of the workers, workers camp. It was as if into the very ground, even the rails seemed to be receding. Once again, Sheriff Payne positioned the men into a skirmish line, each man about 30 feet apart. And on his signal, they advanced toward those swaying pines, each man aware of the pounding of his own heart. The wind blew ever harder as he neared those pines, look of fear present in all their eyes. And then suddenly the heavens roared with the sound of thunder and chain lightning filled the skies. The tracks themselves heaved and buckled. The lightning formed an impenetrable fence intertwined amongst those evil pines. Sheriff Payne, screaming at the top of his lungs, ordered a retreat once again before men lost their lives as well as the sanity of their minds. Sheriff Payne reported their failure once again to the families of the lost. He promised them that they would try again, although wary of the potential human cost. Three more attempts were made to search Whisper Valley, and each time some freak of nature allowed them no success. And finally, Sheriff Payne told the families of the missing it was useless to continue. He said, I'm ashamed of our failure, I must confess. Granddad said, it was if this little nothing of a valley that held no significant position of history or fame contained some un unseen force of evil that would never relinquish the souls of those it claimed. I sat spellbound in a cab of that old pickup truck as Granddad relived this amazing story of his youth. And I believe it was then at that time on Furlong Road that I vowed to someday uncloak the shroud of mystery around Whisper Valley and revealed to the world the truth. Grandfather continued on. Now winter was upon the countryside. Among, among the families of the missing, it appeared all hope had been lost. But then my mother told me to gather all the, all the families at the church. She had an idea that might work if together they could stand the cost. So I ran as fast as I could and told each family to gather at the Elmwood Baptist Church at six o'clock that very night. And when six o'clock came, they were all there. And I must say, they were a sad and sorry sight. Grief and pain had, etched, had been etched in all their faces. Their eyes seemed dulled by, de by depression and despair. And then Pastor Jones turned the meeting over to my mother. She walked up to the le lectern and thanked them all for coming there. She said, I do not wish to fill your heads with false hopes. Lord knows we have all had our share of grief. But late last night, an idea took root within my mind, and so I felt I must share it with you. I'll make my speech short and brief. She said, each time we've attempted to enter Whisper Valley, we've done so with a large, invisible party of able men. Maybe, just maybe, where so many have tried and failed, one man may find a way to enter and return to us again. This idea caused quite a stir amongst the families. All thought it, was, it seemed a viable plan. And then Pastor Jones asked a question that was upon all their minds. Who would be that courageous man? My mother said, I have learned of a man who lives right here in Kentucky. He makes his home out near Mammoth Cave. He is a big game hunter of some, re some renown, and his name is Thaddeus McVeigh. I have heard of him, said Robert Klein. They say he has hunted the most dangerous and elusive, elusive animals known to man. He has lived among some of the most primitive people of the world. 
I, for one, am in favor of this plan. George McCaffrey chimed in. Yes, he has lived among the Aborigines of the land down under and spent three years within the mountains of Tibet. They say he stalks his prey completely by himself and he has just returned from a six month sojourn upon the dark continent. Within minutes, all those present agreed that they should contact McVeigh to see if he would undertake this strange and dangerous commission. And then, and limb an adventure of this kind. Times were lean and cash was short. And so this question lay heavily upon their minds. Granddad said, my mother said she would, granddad said, my mother said she would draft a letter and send it by telegraph the next day. Then we would all simply have to wait for a response from McVeigh. The telegraph was sent and a, cur and a courier delivered the message to McVeigh. Two days later, a reply came into the telegraph office. It said, I will accept, can arrive on December 8th. $500 is the price. Please respond, T. McVeigh. That evening, the families again gathered at the Baptist church and mother read McVeigh's reply. All agreed that though the price was steep, it was more than worth a try. And so each family ended up every cent they could spare. The money was counted and stacked upon the table. When all was tallied, there was $380 in the fund. To reach $500, they were unable. The group was dispirited and downtrodden. Somehow, some way, they would have to come up with $120 more. Then, just as they were about to leave for their homes, Sheriff Bill Payne stepped through the church door. He said, I've heard of your plan. I'm not sure if it is a good idea or not, but I feel as though I have failed you. So I'll provide whatever funds you lack. After all, they were my friends too. With that, he approached the table and put $120 down and every single person there shook his hand. I believe he is the most respected man in that town. The telegraph response was sent the very next day and all waited anxiously for the 8th of December to arrive. All of us wondered what McVeigh would look like and did it did he have what it would take to survive? McVeigh's train would arrive at noon on December 8th. We were all at the station early and waited in suspense. The air was cold and frosty and the fog had settled around the town. It seemed impenetrable and dense. The train arrived right on time and steam rose up from, from around the rails as passengers disembarked with their gear. They seemed to be in a hurry to leave that passenger car and some looked back with what I thought was a sense of fear. And then suddenly that passenger car began to rock side to side as if some great beast remained within. Then from the steam and fog, an enormous man appeared and we all knew it was him. He stood on a station platform before us and as a group, we instinct instinctively took a step back. Even the train seemed glad to be relieved of his weight as he began slowly moving down the track. Thaddeus McVeigh was a mountain of a man, and his presence exuded an air of unbelievable physical strength and power. As a group, we simply stared in awe of him for what seemed to be an hour. He had to have been at least six foot eight inches tall, and his shoulders were as broad as an old barn door. I would guess he tipped the scales at about 350, but I wouldn't be surprised if it were more. His hair was coal, as black as coal, and he wore it in a long braid down the center of his back. His beard reached to the center of his enormous chest, and it too was meticulously groomed with streaks of gray mixed within the ebony black. His eyes were as dark as obsidian, and I swear when he looked at you, he could see into your very soul. And yet I felt a sense of great compassion within this giant of a man whom we had hired to accomplish a formidable goal. He was clothed in buckskins from head to toe, and knee-high moccasins encompassed his feet and around his neck he wore a mysterious necklace adorned with savage looking claws and teeth. McVeigh was a walking arsenal. He carried an array of weapons that seemed to be mere extension of his powerful limbs. His rifle was double barreled and of 75 caliber, fueled by black powder and almost as tall as him. He wore a broad leather belt in which he carried a brace of pistols, easily accessible with either hand. They were large and ornately decorated in the fashion of his native land. But to me, the most interesting weapon carried by this worldly hunter was a dagger. Its blade, curved and wicked, glistened, in a sh glistened sharply in the midday air. The handle was carved in a unique design from bone of some unknown beast that must have stumbled into this hunter's lair. Finally, when the shock of, Mc of McVeigh's appearance wore off, my mother stepped forward and said, my name is Anna McGuire, and I represent the families of the missing men. 
if I hired you to find him, was it A.B. alive or dead? My mother stuck out her right hand and McVeigh grasped her small hand with a delicacy that belied his strength and size. He smiled at her for a full moment before he spoke, and as he did so, his voice held us captive and hypnotized. His voice was a deep, rich baritone, and within it could be heard the rolling accent of his native Scotland. And although he called Kentucky his home now, I believe he was more at ease within the primitive lands. He said it is a, measure, a pleasure to make your acquaintance, dear lady, and I hope I can resolve this problem for all concerned. And as he spoke, he turned his massive head to the right, and upon the left side of his face, we could plainly see a savage scar, obviously caused by a severe burn. The scar ran from the corner of his left eye, clear to the tip of his chin, bisecting that elaborate beard. Added to his massive size and stature, it presented a countenance to be feared. My mother handed him a small leather packet and said, your payment, sir. We have a room for you at our house, and there you may spend the night. McVeigh said, thank you, ma'am, but before we go there, I would like to travel to the site. A few members of the group returned to their homes, but eight of us led McVeigh up to Hemlock Ridge by way of Furlong Road. I swear when McVeigh climbed down from that buckboard, the horses sighed, glad to be relieved of such a load. McVeigh walked over to a large limestone rock, and as we moved toward him, he held up a massive hand and said, please stay there. And then he climbed upon that rock and literally sniffed the cold December air. Grandfather said, I stood beside my mother atop Hemlock Ridge on that cold and snowy ground, and I watched the strangest man I had ever met smell the valley air as if he were some enormous bloodhound. Then I heard a rumbling come forth from that man's massive chest, but no, it was actually a growl to describe it best. And then suddenly those swaying pines came to a standstill, and a sulfurous odor filled the valley air. I believe whatever evil lurked in Whisper Valley was acknowledging Thaddeus McVeigh's presence there. McVeigh then jumped off, leaped off that limestone rock, and I was amazed by the agility of this enormous man. He said, I would like to meet with all the families this evening to discuss my plan. That evening, the families once again met at the Elmwood Baptist Church, and Pastor Jones turned the lectern over to McVeigh. All of us waited anxiously to hear what he had to say. Thaddeus approached, approached the lectern, but then stopped just to the right of it and turned to face the pews. He said, I have agreed to enter Whisper Valley to search for your missing men, but this will not do. With that, he extracted the packet of money mother had given him and laid it atop the lectern. My mother reacted instantly. Mr. McVeigh, she said sharply, that money is more than any of us in a single year could earn. She continued, how dare you? She stopped instantly as McVeigh stepped forward and held up a massive hand. He said, I will undertake this task, but I cannot accept your money. You see, there is something here you need to understand. Grandfather looked me square in the eye as we sat in his old pickup truck. This amazing story he was telling kept me awestruck. Grandfather said, McVeigh looked out at the faces of the families gathered there as the wind outside the church house howled like banshees in the frigid December air. In his rolling Scottish accent, he said, I have met the face of evil upon seven continents, and against it, I have exacted a woeful tally. But no evil is stronger or has existed longer than that that abides in Whisper Valley. He said, I know this demon that resides in Whisper Valley, for I met his evil once before. What I'm about to tell you all must never be mentioned outside this chapel door. Yeah, I got it. Farmer fingers. There we go. Granddad said, we all took a vial of, silence, vial of silence, never to repeat the things we heard that night. I'm telling you the story now, Joshua, so you will be prepared when the time is right. McVeigh continued, this evil which resides in Whisper Valley was old when the world was new. I believe he now holds the immortal souls of your loved ones captive, and to get to me, he has gone through you. This demon, whose name I shall not mention, for to do so only makes him stronger, I have battled at another time and place. And as he spoke, McVeigh turned his head to the right so that we might see the hideous scar that maligned the left side of his face. Tom Collinsford, whose brother was one of the missing men, asked, I thought you were merely a big game hunter. That I am, replied McVeigh. I have hunted several of God's magnificent creations. But with God's blessing and his fortitude, I have extinguished a number of Satan's abominations. 
McVeigh then took the strange, strange necklace he wore from around his neck and held it out for all to see. He said, these trophies are not from lions, tiger, tigers, or bears. They are from the beasts of legion that now cease to be. We all stared at those grotesque and evil looking fangs and claws and agreed they are not from any earthly beasts. McVeigh said, I have an old score to settle with evil that resides in Whisper Valley. Two days from now, I'll enter that playground of hell when the sun rises in the east. But first, he said, you must understand that your missing loved ones have already perished. I believe you all know that now in your hearts and souls. The best that I can do for you is to defeat this demon and thus free their immortal souls. If you choose to believe me, I will enter and face this evil once again. I'll wage a war against this demon, the likes of which he has never seen. If I do not return within five days, you must promise to never send another living soul against this hideous fiend. Granddad continued, as a group, we discussed what we had heard and agreed that incredible as it was, we believed the story McFay had told. We told him we believed him and we would pray for his return. And at that very moment, the wind gathered force and rattled all the churches and windows and doors and inside the air became icy cold. I said McVeigh, he knows of your decision and has made his presence known. Pray now together for his demise and let your faith become a fortress of stone. As I looked at grandfather, I could see the fear in his face from that night so long ago. I grasped his large calloused hand in mine and begged him to continue for the conclusion of the story I simply had to know. As the grandfather continued, his voice grew hoarse and strained. He said, as a group, we knelt and prayed as we never had before. Suddenly the wind died away and the air in the church warmed. May, May, McVeigh let out a, with a hearty laugh and said, together, your faces sent that old demon away like the whip pup from your very door. He said, it is likely I will never return, but I give you my word that it will keep, I will keep that beast penned up in that internal forest and my old, immortal soul will battle him through eternity. But you must promise that someone from each generation of this group must remain here as a gatekeeper of Whisper Valley. The gatekeeper must never let another soul enter that valley, for to do so will provide a means for that evil to leave and propagate. Your combined faith must remain strong and vigilant, and your love of God and each other will forever seal his fate. Grandfather said, we all agreed to McVeigh's terms. We would remain resolute in our faith. We agreed each generation would select a gatekeeper to succeed as predecessor and thus protect the world from the evil of this place. McVeigh said, I will need two days to prepare and then I will attempt to enter and either destroy or forever keep this evil at bay. If in five days I do not return, remember the promise you've made this day. He said, do not attempt to interfere with my preparations as they may appear pagan in design. I have chosen to lead the life of a warrior of God above, but the things I have learned exceed the limits of most men's minds. Grandfather continued, with that, Thaddeus McVeigh stepped down and proceeded to lead us out into the night. The group broke up and hurried to their respective homes, exhausted by reality and fright. When we reached our farm, McVeigh told my mother that it would be more comfortable sleeping in the barn. He could see the fear in all of our eyes, but assured us that our faith would keep us from any harm. He said he would begin his, his preparations that very night and not to be alarmed for he would build a fire far from the barn so as to conduct his practices by the fire's light. With that, he smiled and turned away and he wished us all a peaceful night. Well, we all went to bed, but as try as I may, I could not fall asleep. Along about midnight, I decided to sneak outside. I only wished to take a peek. I snuck downstairs and put on hat and coat, gloves and boots, then opened the back door silently. I made my way stealthily into the woods toward McVeigh's large bonfire, making certain he was not aware of me. I stopped when I was close enough to see well and yet remained hidden among the trees. I was shivering and cold, and yet I was riveted to the scene before me. McVeigh stood before the blazing fire, chanting some incantations from a language I believed to be centuries old. He had stripped naked to his waist, and yet he seemed oblivious to the biting cold. Suddenly he threw something into the fire and the flames leapt and grew even stronger. He repeated some ancient dialogue and then the shadows cast by the flames became even longer. He moved around the fire in some sort of awkward dance and when he stopped, he was but a few yards from me. And despite, my, despite myself, I gasped at the appalling sight before me. McVeigh's torso was a virtual road, road map of grotesque scars of what appeared to be seared flesh. 
and as he moved, his massive musculature made them come to life like a teeming snake's nest. After a few moments, he appeared to relax and sat cross-legged in front of the fire as the flames grew smaller and embers drifted away. And then with a great baritone voice, he said, I, laddie, come in from the bush. I can hear your bones are clattering a mile away. Sheepishly, I moved out from my hiding place and approached him near the fire. The fear of disappointing him was strong upon me, and I certainly did not wish to invoke his ire. When I reached him, he looked up at me, and I sensed a great compassion within his rugged face. With a sweep of his mighty hand, he cleared away snow and ice, and next to him, for me to sit, he made a place. For a few moments, he spoke not a word and simply stared into those dancing flames. When he did speak, his voice was soft and gentle. He said, don't worry, laddie, I'm not angry with you. I knew you would come. Destiny is where we will place the blame. He said, your father was a good and honorable man. Do not ask me how I know. Simply believe me when I say I know such things. You are like him in those ways, and you will reap the bounty that an honorable life brings. He said, believing is what faith is all about. Believing so strong within your heart and soul, that regardless of what all others say or do, within your mind, there is no doubt. He continued, I wear this necklace of tooth and nails, not to boast of my vic victories to people I have met, but rather to, st to strike fear into the heartless souls of Satan's pets. You see, we are surrounded by both good and evil, although most people cannot see it with their eyes. So I wear this hideous thing so it is visible to the beasts of legion that they are not invincible, they must realize. I said, I'm sorry I was spying on you, but I could not sleep, and I just had to know how you would prepare. With that, he said, he said, I have something for you, and into my hand he placed something smooth and sharp. It looked like a tooth from some enormous bear. McVeigh said, that laddie is the eye tooth of the Colm Fior, one of Satan's most favored beasts. Keep it close at hand at all times, and when you begin to feel your faith falter, grasp it hard and your doubts will cease. Now off to bed with you, you will need your strength for the days ahead. You are the eldest son of your father, you must be the man of the house in his stead. McVeigh spent all the next day preparing both himself and his weapons for the harrowing task he was about to undertake. He wished to meet with all the families the next morning at the church about one hour before daybreak. Grandfather said, I'll never forget that day, Tuesday, December 10th, 1889. It was bitter cold when we met outside the Elmwood Baptist Church, a million thoughts running rampant through our minds. When McVeigh appeared, he was dressed in his buckskins and weapons seemed to literally bristle from his massive form. And although the rest of us were cold and fearful, when he spoke, he appeared calm and warm. He said, I just want to remind you of the pledge you made to me before I begin. If I do not return in five days, let no human soul ever enter, ever enter Whisper Valley, for to do so would be the gravest of sins. With that, we all set, up, set off up Furlong Road and arrived at Hemlock Ridge just, just moments before daylight. And as McVeigh bade us all farewell, I chanced to look into his eyes and they were aglow with a mysterious light. McVeigh then walked away from us and once again climbed upon that large limestone rock and peered out over that mysterious land. And as the sun broke over the horizon to the east, I knew within my heart that this was no ordinary man. He stood upon that rock like a giant monument, and then he opened his arms wide so as to gather all the energy the rising sun could tally. And then he let out with a tremendous roar whose volume filled every recess within Whisper Valley. He then faced those swaying pines, and as he spoke, they ceased their constant motion. His voice rolled out over Whisper Valley like a tempest upon the ocean. He said, we meet again, my old adversary. Open up your fortress door. If you use these people to bring me here, it's time to settle this old score. Open up your fiendish gates and allow me access to this valley in which you dwell. It's time you met the true wrath of God, you cowardly beast of hell. I was riveted to that old pickup truck seat as granddad recounted this part of his tale. The fear in his eyes was all too real and his face had grown a ghastly pale. Granddad continued, when McVeigh, when McVeigh finished, thunder filled Whisper Valley and those wicked pines once more began to sway and that valley filled with a stench of evil. And I can recall that smell right to this very day. He said, as a group, we huddled together in fear and prayed, Salva salvation was our only hope. And then we watched in disbelief as McVeigh leapt off that limestone rock and raced down that wicked slope. Most men can barely navigate the eastern slope of Whisper Valley, and then only at a cautious crawl. 
McVeigh ran down that snow-covered maze of boulders and shale, and never once did he falter or fall. As he reached the bottom of the slope, he stood upon the abandoned railroad track. He grasped that, rice, that great rifle of his in both hands, and with a war cry that filled Whisper Valley, he plunged through those swaying pines, and never once did he look back. That valley filled up with the most god-awful sounds as thunder and lightning filled the sky. And, though it, and through it all, you could hear the roar of McVeigh's weapons, cap and ball, as he sought vengeance for our missing loved ones, eye for an eye. Then a tremendous blizzard set in, and as a group, we raced back toward the town. We stopped just once as we heard a horrendous crash and watched in awe as at least a dozen of those towering pine, pines crashed down upon the ground. We all made it back safely to our home, but for three days and nights, we all thought Armageddon was nigh at hand but the most hideous sounds of a tormented hell filled the ears of all who lived upon this land. There were shrieks and screams and the echoes of explosions and gunfire, the likes of which we have never heard before. And as we gathered in prayer at the old Baptist church, we all agreed that McVeigh had recruited the immortal souls of our miss missing loved ones and was giving old what's his name, what for? Granddad said, five days went by and then five weeks and then five months and then five years. McVeigh nor the others ever returned to us. And as grandfather stopped speaking, I could see his eyes well up with tears. But granddad continued as he composed himself, I know he redeemed the souls of my father and the others, and they wage a holy war in that valley yet today. And because they are there, we breathe a purer air as they keep that demon and his evil at bay. And that is why I have stayed here on this land and have prevented anyone from entering Whisper Valley and through their immortal souls, allowing that evil to escape. It's my way of thanking McVeigh and the others for the sacrifice they made. And now for more than 70 years, I have been keeper of the gate. Granddad said, your father has agreed to take over after my time and become the next keeper of the gate. I know you think he is strict and stern, but he uses his position within the church protect, to protect any and all unwary souls from a most ungodly fate. As I sat there in grandfather's old pickup truck, I was astounded by this amazing story I had just heard. And though grandfather produced no concrete proof, I believed his every word. But then my 12 year old mind kicked in and I said, granddad, I believe all you've told me about Whisper Valley, but you have any kind of proof? And with that granddad smiled and reached into the chest pocket of his overalls and produced a large razor sharp cur curved and wicked looking tooth. My eyes bulged at the sight of that thing, the likes of which I had never seen before. I knew without a question of a doubt that it belonged to Satan's pet, the dreaded Colm Fior. Grandfather smiled and said, someday your father will carry this, and then in time he will pass it on to you. It is a reminder there is both good and evil in the world in which we live, so be careful in all that you do. He said, knowing is believing, and believing is this world's most powerful force. Be sure you believe with both your heart and soul before you set upon your course. There are things in this world that cannot be explained, but that does not mean they don't exist. Be wary of all things known to man and those that fade into the mist. Well, it has been over 20 years now since granddad recounted that story, and sadly, he has since passed away. My father is now the gatekeeper of Whisper Valley, and though my travels have taken me around the world, I speak with him almost every day. I've learned not to take for granted the things we know to be fact for they may possess a nature unknown to you and me. My experiences have shown me that most things are not what they seem, and we only possess a tentative grasp upon what we believe to be reality. I make my world in a way that exists beyond the veil, where truth may be a fleeting specter within a shadowy, windswept alley. But when the candlelight burns low and the shadows grow, my mind always returns to Whisper Valley. Yeah, I hope I scared you. <laughs> Yeah, now to kind of just to kind of lighten the uh, tone a little bit, uh, I wrote this uh, short poem. Uh, zombies seem to be all the rage lately. They're not really my uh, my favorite uh, Halloween character, uh, but uh, they are very popular. So uh, I try to put them in a more friendly light. I wrote this story, this little poem called uh, "Zombie Love." Zechariah and Zelda were zombies. How they came to be that way is a story too strange to tell. One might say they were a match made in heaven, but in truth their love was spawned from the fiery pits of hell. Zombie life can prove to be quite stressful, 
In fact, the daily grind can, almost, can be almost more than the average walking dead can stand. It's really tough to get by when you're working with two teeth and one eye, and then suddenly you up and lose your hand. So in zombie land, things are always hard. All day long, it's push and shove. And so it is really rare indeed to find amongst this undead creed the strange event we call zombie love. Zachariah and Zelda met while at a lunch buffet held at the Sinclair City Morgue. And while quite, quite shy at first, they developed a powerful thirst and so went out for drinks, accompanied by the wolfman and the cyborg. The sight of Zelda made Zachariah's de decaying heart beat faster. She looked as inviting as a double train wreck disaster. So without further ceremony, he asked for Zelda's hand in matrimony. Zelda looked deep into Zachariah's single eye of blue, and through crumbling lips she said, I do. And with brittle arms they both embraced and rubbed the noses off each other's face. In zombie land, things tend to move along quite fast. After all, you never know how long such things may last. And so they set the date for the big day, and it was just one week away. The happy couple could hardly wait for the big day to arrive. They were so, alove, so in love, they almost felt alive. There were a million things to do before that special day was here. Zelda had to reattach her right foot while Zacharias searched in dead earnest for his missing left-hand ear. And finally, the wedding day was here. The ceremony was performed by a justice of the pieces. All family members from both sides were present, including all, of all 12 of Zelda's departed nephews and her nieces. After all their vows were read, the JP, who was just a talking head, pronounced them man and wife and wished them all the best in this afterlife. The reception was in full swing. Zelda did a cha-cha with Cousin It, while Zachariah danced the hip-hop with her old friend, the Swamp Thing. They were waltzing gracefully to that classic, the Monster Mash, when suddenly within that reception hall, they heard a terrible crash. It seemed that Zachariah's cousin Bernie was doing a rumba, and he was really on a roll. Then he misstepped and things began, and him being so inept, his head fell into the punch bowl. Things were going, going quite well for the happy couple. At breakfast each day, they would gaze into each other's single eye and linger. They would discuss their day's adventures over coffee and their favorite, lady fingers. But problems began to arise when their relationship became more intimate. You see, Zachariah could not perform his manly duties. Zelda felt hurt and unappreciated. After all, she was queen of the undead beauties. Zachariah seemed to be quite content with holding hands, some hugging, and some kissing. But when Zelda said she felt unsatisfied, Zachariah became defenseless and declared it was not his fault that there are a few pieces of the puzzle missing. They began to quarrel over simple things, and then they began to fight. Soon their lover's spats turned to violence, and they began to bite. Suddenly they both realized they needed counseling if they were going to make their marriage last. Somehow, some way, they needed to return to the simple joys they experienced in their recent past. So they called upon a marriage counselor by the name of Thaddeus McFib, and he suggested that they, that they join him at his house for dinner in their first ses session. <clears throat> he would be serving barbecue spare ribs. So on the evening of their appointment, Zelda tried to engage Zachariah in the small talk as they went upon their way. But Zachariah refused to speak. He had not uttered a single word throughout the entire day. Zachariah remained silent throughout the entire meal. In fact, he never spoke a word. While Zelda responded readily to Thaddeus's questions, the counselor thought Zachariah's behavior was more than just absurd. Finally, in frustration, Thaddeus said to Zachariah, come on now, son, speak to me and help us clear up all this mess. And when he asked El Zachariah, what's the matter? Has the cat gotten your tongue? Zachariah just looked ashamed and merely nodded, yes. With that, Zelda felt her heart simply break in two, and as to breaking too, and as tears poured down her decaying face, she hugged Zachariah and said these endearing words, I truly do love you. Thaddeus' face beamed with joy, and he said, I believe we are really making progress. I think I can solve your problems concerning intimacy if you will simply go to this address. With that, he handed the couple a business card, and upon it, these simple words they read, Samuel Gray, dealer, dealer in slightly used human parts, we cater to the undead. The joyous couple shook crumbling hands with Thaddeus and thanked him for all he had done, then raced away to, Samuel's, to Samuel Gray's before the rising sun. When he reached their destination, they knew they had come to the right place. The billboard read, 50% all, off all used parts, including fingers, feet, and face. Inside, they read another sign held up with some type of bondage tape. 
It said, welcome the 50 shades of gray. We with you shortly and whip you into shape. Soon Samuel Gray approached him and inquired, what may I do for you? 20 minutes later, they left with a tongue and other parts for Zachariah and three tubes of Gorilla Glue. And now the joyous couple once again are feeling like newlyweds. Their nights are so filled with new passion, they almost lose their heads. The moral to this story, there is a moral to this story, one that stands out bright and tall. When it comes to zombie love, love surely conquers all. <laughs> like I said, zombies aren't my favorite uh, <laughs> Halloween character, but some people like them pretty well. So. Uh, that pretty much concludes everything uh, that I had for us tonight. Um, I did want to bring uh, attention though to a couple of things. Uh, um, one of the things is uh, uh, I've mentioned before, and uh, I will again now. Um, uh, I finished just finished reading a, a novel by George Raleigh Adams called *The Found in Pieces*, and uh, it was fantastic. Uh, you owe yourself to read this book. It's it's I read it. Uh, actually in about two evenings is all and it just uh, is astounding so that's uh, found in pieces by george raleigh adams and previous to that i read his other uh, novel was also excellent south of little rock so if you get a chance uh, uh you owe yourself to read these two books found in pieces was amazing and also uh, i become very acquainted with the work of rick eichel uh the first book of his i read was house with a heart uh very fast read uh very inviting uh very friendly read um and then Rick uh, introduced me to his mother's poetry, uh, Helen Corrigan Eichel, uh, to one of his other books called Candles of My Life. And it's about Rick's uh, mother, Rick Corrigan Eichel, and also uh, Lifelines, which is a selection of her poetry, uh, which I uh, just think is fantastic. Uh, I like poetry, but, uh, and this is probably some of the best I've ever read. So if you get a chance, uh, you really need to uh, investigate these authors and also uh, uh, many of the other authors and artists, musicians in that around the area. Uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of local talent out there and uh, uh, it's close by in your local library is a great place to find some of these people and their works. So uh, before I close tonight, I have just uh, um, one thing I do wanna read, another poem actually. And, and this is just kind of a strange event that occurred a, a while back and uh, I call it a warrior's path. Uh, my wife and I were in, in uh, Walmart, uh, this was about a year ago we we're uh, trying to trying to buy paper. We used to buy paper ten cases at a time if we can get it. So we were in there several times, and uh, while we were in there, uh, I spied this gentleman, and he looked uh, very familiar. He looked like uh, a person I had known a few years, well, quite a few years ago, and hadn't seen in quite a while. And as I got closer to him, I, I realized it wasn't him, but I didn't notice his name. On, he was wearing a Walmart vest, an employee vest, but I didn't see any name tag or anything on there, and. Um, it really bugged me. So we went back two or three different times over the next few weeks to uh, try to get paper and stuff. And I'd see him in there. And uh, one day uh, I was walking to the south end of the store. It's quite a stretch across there. And he was coming the other way. We went past each other and I told myself I wasn't going to turn around and look back. Well, I got about 50, 60 feet away and I did. And just as I turned around and looked back, he was at the other end of the aisle. He waved like this and continued on. Well, it gave me an idea for this poem. I went home, wrote the poem, and I told Betty, my wife, I said, um, next time we go back there, and this guy's there, I'm gonna tell him who we are, give him a, a copy of our magazine, and present him with this poem, uh, and uh, maybe get a picture together with him, because I just, it was such a strange feeling that uh, I'd met this guy someplace before and really couldn't place it. So we went back there, and until this day, uh, I have not found this gentleman. Uh, we've asked who he was. Everybody seems to know is uh, who we were talking about, but we haven't found him. <laughs> it's really a strange, uh, strange situation. So uh, I have yet to give him this poem, but I am going to read it. Just uh, it's a little bit mysterious, and thought it might kind of go with the season here. So uh, this is called the Warrior's Path. As walking through the Albion Walmart store, my mind a million miles away, when suddenly I sensed a presence there as an employee passed by me on his way. I continued on, although troubled by some vague and ling lingering instinct for perhaps 20 feet or more. And then I abruptly spun around inside the Elvian Walmart store. About the time I spun around, he was turning too. I looked at him and he looked at me and together we experienced a great sense of deja vu. Deep down within my heart of souls, I know I've lived a hundred lives before. And this ancient warrior and I had met in battle upon some ancient shore. 
Perhaps it was at Galilee or the Battle of Turin. And as the centuries went rolling by, we fought with honor time and time again. I was his adversary and he was mine. I know not how many battles we won or lost, but in his eyes I, I recognized a kindred spirit and once again our paths have crossed. As I stared at him, I began to see him as I had seen him more than 2,000 years ago. He was tall and powerfully built, a warrior to the bone. And he saw me as I was then, an ancient warrior baptized in the art of war. And thus we eyed each other warily within that crowded store. We had met in battle countless times throughout the ages. And the many lives we each had led were merely histories turning pages. To live or die mattered not, for we, we knew each would rise again. Broad swords and battle axes were the tools of our trade. Only destiny would choose the where and when. We fought not for fame nor glory or to appease some feudal lord. The challenge in our code of honor are the reasons we cross both souls and swords. And now we meet once again at this civilized time and place, each of us wondering why are we here, two combatants of the warrior race. We circled each other cautiously. We could feel the electric charge within the air. And as we contemplated our course of action, shoppers stopped and stared. They all, know, they all knew something strange and powerful was about to happen here. And upon each and every face, I saw anticipation mixed with latent fear. The crowd grew larger as we drew near, our eyes locked upon each other. Only God knew what we would choose to do as he gazed down upon these warrior brothers. Sparks flew from the lights above, thunder rolled throughout the store. Lightning flashed as patrons dashed toward the exit doors. The sun of brimstone filled the air as we stood there face to face. And then from somewhere deep inside that warrior's cold proclaimed, this was not the time or place. And so we stood there staring at each other, two ancient warriors from some strange and exotic land. And as that warrior's cold held us at bay, he offered me his hand. And I grasped that massive gnarled hand and felt this kindred spirit that bound our souls together, him and me. For upon this cosmic warrior's path, we shall tread for all eternity. And so we turned and went our separate ways, two warriors from some, from some ancient past, knowing full well we'd meet upon some future field of honor upon the warrior's path. So like I said, this poem has been undelivered to the man it was written for. <laughs> A very strange experience. So I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourselves and uh, have a good evening.